it's so helpful to feel at some base level psychologically safe. We can't ensure that. That's hard, right? And even if you've been coming to this center for um, years, we still might, might not be able to ensure that. But the kind of casual engagement and laughing, hopefully, that really helps us drop into the body, drop into the belly and be more available for our sit. Um, so for friends online, I hope that there was some laughter and enjoyment with those who are around you before joining us. And um, tonight, because many of us just ate, <laughs> we're actually going to start with a little bit of the teachings and you know, last time we were all together, I barely got through like one page of what I think is probably like the most, not the most important, but like one of the richest parts of this book. And it's only like six or seven pages, but the actual description of the night of awakening, it is so beautiful. And so I thought it would be nice for us to start with that. Um, so I'll give us just a minute or two of grounding, but then we will go through um yeah, that kind of story around this really important evening and so many teachings woven into that evening. And then we will, yeah, close with a sit. And for those of us who've been coming for a while, you know, we are, we are looking at this text by Thich Nhat Hanh in which he brings together a lot of the historical um, fragments that are known about the life of the Buddha. And again, I will mention, we don't know how many of these are true or if any of them are true. And yet the story is so inspiring and has such lasting power. In some of the contexts in which I teach, we're thinking about how do we balance what is known by contemporary scientific knowledge and you know, indigenous knowledge or spiritual knowledge, knowledge that's been passed down orally that hasn't been studied by um, third person observation, right? With machines and technology or surveys. And we want to hold them both. I think it is important to recognize that if you have a story that's been passed down for 2,500 years and helps people you know, experience transformation, it's probably some benefit to the story, right? Um, and also, of course, we have a lot of the contemporary science, which looks at these practices, also really important. So it's, uh, yeah, doing, doing that in real time here, of really, for me, uh, as some of you know, like I, I love the science, but I love leaning into this story and really letting the narrative of the story inspire us. Um, and this evening, as many parts of this book instruct us, look for the first, first person experience. It's so ironic to say, I'm so glad you all are here because I want you to engage with this form of knowledge, but don't listen to anything I say. Actually, it's really important to pay attention to what happens inward. And that's true. And a lot of the teachings here are, how do we get to that direct experience? So without more words on that, let's give ourselves just a couple moments here. Again, not a long practice. We'll do the long practice to close tonight. And we can think of this practice as sort of calibrating our mind, heart, and body. I'm taking a moment first to experience this, the form body, the physical body. Feeling the areas where we notice support, maybe under our feet or under our seat.
Notice areas of warmth and coolness. And noticing now the entire field of sensation through the form body, maybe feelings of fullness, maybe feelings of fatigue, areas that might feel achy or tingling. Just allow our attention and awareness to really be saturated by the experiences throughout the body. As we do so, experiencing a sense that the body is meditating itself just through this awareness and attention, not something we are imposing, not a looking down upon the body, a sensing from within the body itself. Then imagine as though we could peel back one layer or look behind a veil or curtain and experience the subtle body, the energy that's not quite the aches or the fullness, the energy in which we can sense emotion residue. And again, just let ourselves feel and notice from within the body what might be here in terms of feelings and emotions or moods. And without an agenda, just curiosity and kindness, notice what might be held in the heart. There might be a difficulty in experiencing the heart. Maybe there's some, there are walls up. Maybe we feel disconnected. No problem at all. Just softening and noticing and creating that intention to connect with the feelings. Invite a softening through the muscles in the face, a softening through the shoulders and the hands, the areas we often armor up in order to meet the world. It's giving ourselves this softness, this gentleness, and continue making space for whatever is here in the feeling body.
And without forcing it, be curious and notice, is there anything that's already good here? Maybe a sense of deeper well-being, maybe just a sense of okayness. Again, no problem if it's hard to connect with that feeling. But setting that intention to connect with the good that's always already here. Just obscured or covered up sometimes. And in invoking this great master teacher, Thich Nhat Hanh, we can enhance this sense of goodness by imagining a smile across our heart. And gentleness and openness and warmth of a smile unfolding through the entire chest area. Inviting that smile into the belly, softening, easeful. Feeling the whole body smiling. So sweet, that instruction from Thich Nhat Hanh, that bringing of the smile in. It can feel a little forced if you go right into it, but I think working into it, such a nice tool um, to use, to imagine that. And, you know, that visualization of something that's so familiar. When we smile, we feel, so, we feel good, right? And what is it like to bring that in an embodied sense? Any... Thoughts or questions on that practice before we move into the text for tonight? Anybody notice they were smiling as they were bringing a smile? Yeah. So there is, you know, this, it's not folk wisdom, but actually demonstrated research. When we smile, it does and venerate the inner system of emotion to feel good. But it has to be including these eye muscles right here. It can't just be 
<laughs> doesn't work. Can you give the contrasted example? Can you do, can you do I and no I? This is I. This is I. <laughs> and as you get older, it's a lot easier to see because we got like, <laughs> and then, yeah, which it's um. So you'll see these, you know, if you look on the internet for, you know, how to be happy, one of the exercises is like putting the pen and like balancing it here and it makes you smile. And it's kind of, it's kind of not wrong. <laughs> yeah, I put the pen here and then it forces you to smile a little bit. So, but it's, you know, it's really uh, a forced smile never feels good. So, <laughs> yeah. So, gosh, yeah, without further ado, I'm just going to start reading parts of this uh, and give us some chance to talk about it together. Um, it's just so rich. Beneath the papala tree, the hermit Gautama focused all his formidable powers of concentration to look deeply at his body. He saw that each cell of his body was like a drop of water in an endless flowing river of birth, existence, and death. He could not find anything in the body that remained unchanged or that could be said to contain a separate self. Intermingled with the river of the body was the river of feelings in which every feeling was a drop of water. These drops also jostled with one another in a process of birth, existence, and death. Some feelings were pleasant, pleasant, some unpleasant, and some neutral, but all of his feelings were impermanent. They appeared and disappeared, just like the cells of his body. So this, you know, this, you know, first process of him really <clears throat> applying the con concentrative powers that he gained towards his own experience. So even in our brief meditation, did folks notice, did feelings come and go? Were they different? Yeah, right? They, you know, start out one way and they shift and change. And that shouldn't be so surprising, except that we always forget, <laughs> right? Like when we're in the grip, I, I had a, a really, it's funny because I was happening. I was like, oh, this will be good to talk about tonight. I had a difficult emotion at work. Um, and I recognized that it totally felt permanent, real and just the, like I was completely right. And that was the only thing that was true. And it's such a powerful feeling, right? It's like your whole body rises up to it. And we forget like, this is just something that's coming and going. This is, you know, and, and truly an hour later, none of it remained with me. So this kind of his first real like getting into the core teachings and a lot of this first part of his awakening is on dependent origination. Such a fancy word. Um, for those of us who studied it, it's, it's actually quite simple. Everything is connected, dependent on one another. And he's really starting to recognize that first by looking at his experience. Um, he said with his great concentration, he next explored the river of perceptions, which flowed alongside rivers of body and feelings. The drops in the river of perception intermingled and influenced each other in their process of birth, existence, and death. If one's perceptions were accurate, reality revealed itself with ease. But if one's perceptions were erroneous, reality was veiled. People were caught in endless suffering because of their erroneous perceptions. They believed that which is impermanent is permanent. That which is without self contains self. That which has no birth and death has birth and death. And they divided which is that which is inseparable into parts. Not the most clear, I think, their um, writing on it. He'll get a little bit more into it. But I love this continuity of the metaphor of the river. I imagine most of us have sat by a river before. And there's a sense of continuity, like, there's a river flowing, like that's the river. We don't often think of it as, you know, what we're looking at is super temporary and moving. It came from one place and it's headed to another. And so that metaphor that our moment to moment experience, we're like, oh yeah, this is just, you know, reality. But that our reality is like constantly changing, constantly flowing. Such a nice application 
of that metaphor, like that whole, you know, he says, um, like these drops in the river of perception intermingled and influence each other and the river of his body. So just this idea of the constant flow and shift and change. And I think the most tangible way we can experience it is like that noticing of the body, noticing of these tactile sensations, noticing that our thoughts, feelings are always changing. <clears throat> so that I love. Um, and this idea of perception, he's gonna get into a bit more. Um, this next part, this next section is really on ignorance. It's another big word in Buddhism that's really misunderstood, I'd say. And I think when I first heard it, it felt very judgmental. I was like, wow, I didn't know we were going to be so negative on certain people and experiences. Um, and I'm curious from folks when they've kind of heard about ignorance before, um, were there ways that it felt useful or like something that has stuck out? Like, what does that mean? That's something we're we're born with. Yeah, Mace. Can you repeat or do you want me to come off there? Um, I can repeat, okay. but I'm sure it'll be better if you say it. Well, the thing that's most like been meaningful to me is the forgetting of the profound interconnectedness with all other people. Right. Like that feels like it happens all the time, and it feels like when I remember. It feels really good. Yeah. So Mace is saying that it's this, um, the ignorance is when we like completely forget. I love the word forget or fall asleep to, right? Forget the profound interdependence of all beings. And that again, another flowery word and concept, interdependence of all beings. Like what, what does that mean? Um, so in this next part, he talks about it a little more. Um, he, he, he has some other people with raised hands. Oh, great, Claudia. And then I Claudia. We have um, Kama Bruce. I hope I'm saying your name properly. And we have Geneva. Okay. So you asked when what have we felt that ignorance has been helpful to us? Yes. More. Oh. How concept of ignorance in, in the context of these teachings has been helpful? Well, uh, partly like what uh, Mace said about uh, our interconnectedness, but I'm thinking about, for example, being hurt by people in, say, our family of origin, and then realizing that oftentimes they did it out of ignorance or out of the conditioning or baggage that they carry on from their ancestors or from where they came from, that it was not necessarily malicious. Yeah. So I think understanding that, it, it allows me to have more compassion yeah. uh, and forgiveness because then I feel like, you know, they didn't know any better and they were maybe, I mean, sometimes they became aware and worked on it and changed and evolved. And sometimes they didn't, but you know, that was, that was their path and that's, that's what they have. So that's how it's, it's helped me. Beautiful. Yeah. And I think you're kind of slipping in there also the recognition of karma, right? So how this family member who may be hurting us they are the accumulation of so many causes and conditions, right? Not necessarily, it's not about us. <laughs> I mean, it's about us, but it's not only about us, right? And that, that idea, you know, a big part of ignorance is this sense of, you know, ourselves being totally separate, but it's not just separate. Like sometimes I feel like we get a, a funny notion of separate. It's that we're the star of the show. <laughs> like it's not just that we're separate, like it's about us. And that is such a veil of ignorance, you know, like, wow. Imagine how much less suffering we would feel if we didn't think it was about us so much, like 50%. 80%, you know, and like the, the wisdom you're talking about, Claudia. So like, you know, the antidote to ignorance is wisdom. The wisdom you're talking about, that can take us years. We can feel so much pain and suffering. And, you know, spoiler alert, ignorance is the cause of our suffering. That's the great insight the Buddha has, right? Thank you so much. 
Hello, please unmute. I can't see your name. My writing's not that good. My reading that far away. This is Kiara Moose, but that's it's my first name merged with my last name. So okay. yeah, that's Krishna though. Um, so I had a question. I had two thoughts to answer your point. Um, for interdependence, is it interdependence of beings or is it interdependence of phenomena? So I interpret it as phenomena, not beings. Do you think that that is necessarily different? How would that, or I guess, how would that be different? Well, I think that like one argument would be that material objects don't carry consciousness, but then beings do. So therefore like trying to trade beings for consciousness in any sort of system creates like sort of a big problem. But I was thinking about like infrastructure, even when you build infrastructure, there are consequences and they affect people. But depending on how the infrastructure is built, then they might prioritize building development over some land for some. Like I went to Japan and they basically build buildings there. And I felt like the buildings have an energy. And I was mm. like, the buildings have an energy. Or it's mm. interacting with me. Yeah. There's no people around here. There's just me and the building. But they feel yeah. like there's this thing. Hmm. Well, it almost feels like the whole city has its own planning, infrastructure, and development hmm. for the future but it still has, it's connected to ideas from people. It's just interesting. So I just was like, okay, I don't think it's just interdependence of beings anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and the more than human world, right? So phenomena, but also um, it would, included in that is wind and earth and stones. And um, you're beautifully highlighting the next passage. So yes, exactly that. Yeah. Okay. And my thought on ignorance was, um, I mean, the most common thing is when you realize you made a mistake. So you, I use the word realize. So you realize that you're ignorant before and you have more information or more context now so that changes your perspective. I think yes. that's really common. And yeah. um, kind of related to it is, I think ignorance in a relationship context could be not like I'm ignorant, I was wrong, or they're ignorant, they were wrong. It's more that in a conversation where two people are talking, both people can actually be ignorant. So both people can be wrong. That's kind of the interesting big perspective you can take. So that makes it really big. Because instead of being, being like, oh, he doesn't understand what I'm thinking or she or they don't understand what I'm thinking. It can be, we don't even understand what's going on at all. None of us know what's going on here. <laughs> exactly. I've experienced that. <laughs> and I love you highlighting that because I think, again, what he says in this next passage um, is really about kind of the aspects of suffering that all of us can have at the same time, the fear, the anger, the hatred, the arrogance, the jealousy. And we can be one of us in fear, one of us in, in anger and completely ignorant or delusional. Sometimes the word delusional is used, which I also like. Ignorant just feels a little dismissive sometimes. Um, the delusional or blocked from seeing things clearly feels very resonant. Thank you so much. And did was there another hand there? I, I'll uh, I'll go ahead and read this next one because folks are kind of anticipating it. So next, he's shown his awareness on the mental states, which were the sources of suffering, fear, anger, hatred, arrogance, jealousy, greed, and ignorance. Mindful awareness blazed in him like a bright sun, and he used that sun of awareness to illuminate the nature of these negative mental states. He saw that they all arose due to ignorance. They were the opposite of mindfulness. They were darkness, the absence of light. He saw that the key to liberation would be to break through ignorance and enter deeply into the heart of reality and attain a direct experience of it. Such knowledge would be the knowledge of intel not be the knowledge of intellect, but of direct experience. And it's interesting, you know, the pointing out here is look directly at what you believe to be real. And I've had a, a couple of teachers, Minja Rinpoche and, and Sokni Rinpoche, both say that when we're having a difficult emotion, turn towards it, like amplify it and pay attention. And I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> like, that sounds terrible. But often we do find like the insubstantial nature of it when we do that. Like we turn towards our anger 
and we can find a field as energy, recognize it as this um, like intensity, but often we get a little bit caught in rumination. I think it's a pretty high level practice. Maybe not if you're an you know, incarnate Lama, um, but for a lot of us, turning towards the emotion is like adding fuel to the fire. I think we can look at it like me looking at this experience. I, today I felt um, like kind of hurt or disrespected and it was like my entire world and experience. An hour later, I could really look at it and be like, what was really going on there? Wow, because of my delusion, I thought I was being intentionally harmed. I thought it was about me. I'm not seeing that this person's busy or that's actually a misunderstanding. And you know, you really don't get to see all that different phenomena. And I think for most of us, we have these difficult or challenging experiences or mental events, and we're like really in it, then we kind of distract away or suppress it, and then we move on. We're not necessarily like liberating it. We're not actually doing that work of having a direct experience of the emotion and not the emotion, really the mental state and seeing its insignificance, really seeing that it's perception um, as opposed to reality. And what I think is really important here is the difference between mental states and emotions. So one thing is, you know, me feeling hurt at work today for an hour. That would be an emotion. There was a trigger, I had an experience, I responded, I went and self soothed with a decaf coffee, um, and I did the trick. <laughs> I don't know. Um, and then and then there's the mental state. And my mental state would be one in which I've been wronged. I'm always wronged. Those people are wrong. It's an ongoing view. It's kind of like a, a way that we're feeding into this. And these mental states, especially, they, they really need that direct perception for us to look deeply. Having a temporary emotion it can absolutely help us understand some of the kind of root causes or root beliefs that create delusion. So again, in this case, um, like what's the deal for disrespect for me? Like, do I think I'm really important? Like, what do I think will happen? Like it's, I can look into that and see where that separate sense of self or this precious sense of self is getting kind of poked at. So our emotions can help us see these overarching qualities of our mind, these mental states. And in this case, uh, he saw that they all arose due to ignorance. This is such a provocative phrase. Like I invite everyone here to imagine the last time they were really mad at someone. Okay, kind of. Does that come, is anyone struggling with that? <laughs> Looking at it now, if we really like pull it apart and look at all the causing conditions, look at everything that might've been happening in that person or person's experience, in our experience, can we still feel fully justified in our anger? This is a very provocative thought. <laughs> Uh, I hear a yes. <laughs> yeah, and I think it's a really provocative exercise. The first time um, a teacher asked me to do this, to look at essentially my role and responsibility in an emotion of anger, I was like, no, you don't know this person. Like, <laughs> you got this wrong. And, you know, I just think it's it's like as we start to pull apart all the layers, all the conditions, and not just like, oh yeah, I want to have compassion for them, even though they're wrong. <laughs> like truly, like really looking into it and, you know, recognizing that kind of co-emergence of the anger. And if we realize that, then it's hard to stay angry. It's hard to feel like it's, it's really, truly that person's wrong and I'm right. You can totally debate me on this, but not in the specifics, because I, I don't know the person. I can't tell you. But, you know, what's that like to consider that this anger towards another being maybe is not completely true or maybe coming out of ignorance? Does that seem plausible? Yeah. Do you mind using the mic for folks? I, I just I wonder if you could clarify or say more about 
co-emergence? Well, we are going to get there in just a moment, but yeah, I mean, essentially, or not exactly co-emergence, but that when we are thinking one person is entirely wrong and we are entirely right, we're missing out on that key truth of interdependence, right? And that all things have causes and conditions that lead to it. So again, here, this idea that the key to liberation is to break through ignorance and enter deeply into the heart of reality and attain a direct experience of it. And so it says here in the past, Siddhartha had looked for ways to vanquish fear, anger, and greed. But the methods he had used had not borne fruit because they were just attempts to suppress these feelings. He now understood the cause was ignorance, that one was liberated from ignorance, mental obstructions would vanish on their own, like shadows fleeing before a rising sun. The insight was the fruit of his concentration. So when he's, it's a little clearer when he talks about phenomena as opposed to emotions but essentially he's saying here that when he deeply looks at emotions and mental states he realizes none of them are true in that they are entirely the truth of the way we believe them to be they're not actually you know um there's no sense in which our anger can be fully instantiated and true from both sides i don't know it's a tough one yeah Chief. Yeah, I have a couple of things. So um let's see if I can even do this. Um oh, this is one of those mics you need to hold right next to you, and these are one of those nope, chairs. There it is. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. I mean, I think that some of this stuff is danger zone for me slash what I've seen in my life because like Okay, I trust ultimate reality to to know to hold that um, there were all these causes and conditions. It wasn't really his fault or whatever, or like the idea of fault is is inherently like incoherent and blah 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 blah. Um, I'll let you know. I'll let that be ultimately true, and um, I'm not gonna like then use that to. It's it's dangerous for me to like be like okay, therefore I can't feel anger. And in fact, like that's that's really unhealthy. Ben needs to feel anger right now. In fact, I might need a few weeks to be like I hate this person's got so much, and knowing that that sort of the truth of like there are other considerations yeah. like is like oh. I know that eventually I'll, this will, yes. I'll get through this phase. Yeah. Right. And like saying you have to do it right away is really messed up. Yeah. Sometimes in my experience, it's been really messed up yeah. and basically amounts to like, you know, in extreme cases, just let abuse happen or like blame the victim or this kind of thing. Yeah. So I, I don't know, I guess, um, I found it's really useful to be careful with, what if if I have sort of unrealistic or unhealthy expectations that I will somehow be, you know, immediately a a um a sort of wise dude who doesn't have any of of that. Yeah. 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 No, I, I think that's so beautifully said and such an important point. Yeah. And very often, you know, this is such a important area of discourse between contemporary science and Buddhism. Um, I agree that when you're suppressing or denying or avoiding anger because you think like, oh, but, you know, this, the Buddha, like he saw through it, like we're done. But it's the second point you said, which is recognizing like being angry and letting yourself be angry and also knowing this will pass. Mm -hmm. This isn't where I land. Mm -hmm. I don't stay here. Mm -hmm. And I actually think feeling our anger and knowing the kind of um, intensity of it helps it pass because mm -hmm. that's not comfortable. Mm -hmm. Right. But it's more that we don't feel justified forever in our anger. Mm. You know, I think the idea of like bringing that, you know, shining our light of true wisdom or attention or awareness onto anger, we start to see that it like it is all these components. Mm -hmm. But I agree. And I don't think also, right, if we if we're releasing our anger, it doesn't mean that we put ourselves in harm's way. Same with compassion. If we extend compassion towards people who've done harm, which is a very high level practice, that doesn't mean we allow the harm. And I think that's a huge misunderstanding sometimes that you'll hear folks say, you know, have compassion, but that doesn't mean you have to like go back into the house where um, 
there is pain and difficulty and potential of suffering. Mm -hmm. You can have compassion for someone from 10,000 miles away mm -hmm. and it's great. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 I mean, I think at, at some point, uh, this overlaps with just being like, you know, one grieving process is not better than another. Hmm. If there are two people who go undergo, let's say are harmed by someone in a similar way. If one of them is being pissy after a week and the other one is like, you know, doing fake compassion after a week or even real compassion after a week, that's not like somehow better as is they have their process. That's right. Yeah. And, and we actually, though we all universally experience emotions, like what makes us emotional and how intensely emotional we get and how long we stay there. That is different. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Great. Thank you. Chris has a question. Krishna. Can I read comment? just more here? I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna read just one more page and then go back to questions if that's cool. Because oh, I keep even though it's only three pages, I keep delaying and I really want to give us the goods. So I'm gonna read just a little bit through more. And I and I want to just highlight here. Um, in this paragraph, it said Siddhartha had looked for ways to vanquish fear, anger, and greed, but the methods he had used had not borne fruit because they were only attempts to suppress such feelings and emotions. This is like written about the 21st century. Like we are so good at temporary methods to suppress, avoid, and deny our emotions to temporarily escape, but to not fundamentally shift our worldview. There's so many ways we can do that. Like, that is totally how capitalism <laughs> co-ops <laughs> these practices, you know, like that's cool. Reduce a little stress. Good job. Okay. Now back in it, right. Not really fundamentally changing. And I just love that insight, you know, that here he had gone to these, all these accomplished masters and they had taught him these incredibly high levels of concentrative practice. And he was in these beautiful realms, but then he came back and he's like, Oh, but that hasn't shifted how I experience my world. So they're still suffering. Um, so then <clears throat> he smiled and looked up at the papala leaf imprinted against the blue sky. So I just like love this imagery. So he's looking at this single leaf, its tail blowing back and forth as if calling him. Looking deeply at the leaf, he saw clearly the presence of the sun and stars. Without the sun, without light and warmth, the leaf could not exist. This was like this because that was like that. He also saw in the leaf the presence of clouds. Without clouds, there could be no rain. And without rain, the leaf could not be. He saw the earth, time, space, and mind. All were present in the leaf. In fact, at that very moment, the entire universe existed in that leaf. The reality of the leaf was a wondrous miracle. So beautiful. And I was really challenging myself. Like, <laughs> I feel like that's easier to do in the natural world. Like, can we do it anywhere? Can we like bring that sense of awe that allows us to expand and expand and expand and deepen and deepen and deepen and see the wonder of the universe in everything. So inspiring, so inspiring. And that, that, you know, that deep knowing, you know, that understanding and, you know, based in science, right? Truly, like the leaf didn't all of a sudden exist one day. It's this process, this ongoing process. And again, that as a metaphor for all phenomena, all experiences. Um, so we ordinarily think that a leaf is born in the springtime. Siddhartha could see that it had been there for a long, long time in the sunlight, the clouds, the tree, and in himself. Seeing that the leaf had never been born, he could see that he too had never been born. Both the leaf and he himself had simply manifested. They had never been born and were incapable of ever dying. That's a provocative statement. We'll get back to that. With this insight, ideas of birth and death, appearance and disappearance dissolved. And the true face of the leaf and his own true face revealed themselves. He could see that the presence of any one phenomena made it possible, made possible the existence of all other phenomena. One included all. All were contained in one. The leaf and his body were one neither possessed a separate permanent self. 
neither could exist independently from the rest of the universe. Seeing the interdependent nature of all phenomena, Siddhartha saw the empty nature of all phenomena, that all things are empty of a separate, isolated self. He realized that the key to liberation lay in these two principles of interdependence and non-self. Clouds drifted across the sky, forming a white background to the translucent leaf. Perhaps that evening the clouds would encounter a cold front and transform to rain. Clouds were one manifestation, rain was another. Clouds also were not born and would not die. If the clouds understood that, surely they would sing joyfully as they fell down as rain on the mountains, forests, and rice field. So yeah, just really that like deep seeing into this nature of interconnection of all things. And it doesn't have to be a belief, you know, like a religious belief. It's just this like deep, clear seeing into how everything is, you know, is made present. Um, and I think we can, I don't know if you all have ever done just like gazing meditation at a flower, at a leaf. I mean, it gets trippy really quickly. I don't know if I've gotten like Siddhartha level trippy and like felt that I was the leaf and the universe is in the leaf. Um, but interestingly, if you look at the transcendental movement in the United States, like folks like John Muir and Ralph Waldo Emerson, very similar insights by just looking so closely at nature, the entire world in a drop of dew. You know, so it's not a it's not a religious spiritual belief. It's just that deep seeing and knowing. And it is, it's so, it's such a relief. It's so different from this kind of self-oriented concept that it's me trying to make it out here against all of you who are also trying to make it out here. Like it's such a different orientation and it's true, like kind of undeniably true. Um, and why don't, why do we forget that, right? I won't blame capitalism again, but it's certainly not helping. <laughs> Um, so yeah, still a comment up there question. Yeah, I have a comment slash question. <laughs> and the reason I have this comment slash question is I was thinking about the statement you made about ignorance before, but if you looked at like, uh, when Siddhartha was especially going to either the Vedic traditions or what previously was more like the Hindu traditions of some type. I mean, they constantly talk about ignorance as if the, it's the only thing that's mm. kind of like one of the features. And they may use a different name or term for it, but that's kind of one of their core things. And that's where he got his practice before. But he considered it suppression or just going to transcendental states. But what I understood is, I just don't understand why he had such a like, um, I won't say aversion to, because you've definitely learned many things from those like jhanic practices. But why he was like, everyone else is just using jhanas to suppress or just go to trance states. They're not using jhanas for insight. I was thinking, right. is that really true that every single person he's met has never used jhanas for insight? Because the first time okay. I've ever done a jhana, I used it for insight. And I don't think I'm better than any of the previous folks from yeah. the old generation yeah. of the tradition. It would be a great question, but we'll never know, you know, and when he talks about especially his early times interacting with, um, you know, more in the Brahmin um, worldview, he just found that there was so much inequality that was perpetuated. Not necessarily that was part of the belief system, but at the time it was politicized and that there was a subjugation. And so for him, any you know belief system that subjugated some wasn't true liberation, wasn't clear seeing. But the question on the jhana is a, is a great one, but we'll never know, right? Why did why did Siddhartha decide he needed to create his own way and and not use another way? For at least what we hear in this book is that it was a kind of sublimation, you know, denying, distracting, even though these mind states were so rich and beautiful. Oh. Yeah. yeah. And there's, you know, other accounts. Um, also, I think, you know, not in this book, in another account, when his wife asks him, did you really need to go under the tree? 
to find this? And he said, no, I actually didn't, but I didn't know that at the time, but that's one account. So we, we really, you know, we'll just, we're not sure. Cause I agree. I mean, it's really beneficial to have, you know, some of these advanced states of practice where we can in some ways like elevate ourselves or understand ourselves. So the main yeah. interesting feature for me was just like the self-inquiry thing seems directly applicable to the not self claim. And then therefore, if you just did jhanic practice, did self-inquiry, I, I don't think I'm the first person to do that. And that's kind of where I kind of was thinking. I was like, wow, like I just was kind of surprised that he spent so much time under on his own under three. But maybe the idea is that he needed to spend it on his own to understand it as opposed yeah. to just hearing from teachers. So he had to kind of walk on his own. I really think that's true. And the direct experience and then the philosophical approach for him, at least that he, he seems to have found as new. Um, so I'm going to read just a little more here. There's a couple more passages that are really beautiful. Um, he says, illuminating the rivers of his body, feelings, perceptions, mental formations, and consciousness. Siddhartha now understood that impermanence and emptiness of the self are the very conditions necessary for life. Without impermanence and emptiness of the self, nothing could ever grow or develop. If a grain of rice did not have the nature of impermanence and emptiness of self, it could not grow into a rice plant. If clouds were not empty of self and impermanent, they could not transform into rain. Without an impermanent non-self nature, a child could not grow into an adult. Thus, he thought, to accept life means to accept impermanence and emptiness of self. The source of suffering is a false belief in permanence and the existence of separate selves. Seeing this, one understands that there is neither birth nor death, production nor destruction, one nor many, inner nor outer, large nor small, impure nor pure. All such concepts are false distinctions created by the intellect. If one penetrates into the empty nature of all things, one will transcend all mental barriers and be liberated from the cycle of suffering. So this, yeah, I mean, this, again, these insights here, especially this, that thus to accept life means to accept impermanence and emptiness of self. And that acceptance, um, some of you may know, but like acceptance is such a, a key tenant of mem many therapies, right? So of course, ACT, acceptance commitment therapy, but even DBT, CBT, this ability to kind of accept life as it is. Um, and my teacher often says, you know, this great generosity that we have with life is to really accept life on life's terms and how much pain we experience when we try to deny that or make it our way, right? So curious from folks, again, I, I feel like it can get a little conceptual here. So when one understands there's neither birth nor death, how does that resonate for you? Does that make sense? Like, what does, I mean, obviously like we were born, we will die. What does he mean when he's talking about neither birth nor death, like in this context? Well, if I may, um, please. I had such, I had such a nice experience reading this a couple of weeks ago, or when I when I went back to it. And to me, it's all about the big everything, and um, and just he Thich Nhat Hanh, I, I was fortunate enough to go to some of his retreats. He used to come here every year, like in the eighties and nineties. Um, like he does a good job and you probably get recordings of him telling you like he's talking about a tangerine and yeah, without the tangerine, there could be nothing. You know, we're all, everything is connected. So to me, it's about, I never think of it in terms of those other people, like no one gets, no one's living and dying, you know, just or other people's right. karma. But I noticed that, you know, people talk about the Bodhisattva way as the right view and the right view, this small little grip, grippy grabby self. Cause I have my own, I cause myself so much suffering because I'm grasping. And if I really have a strong reaction to somebody, it's because I wasn't, there's a lack of generosity for lack of better way to say it. Like I'm just so concerned with me and I'm being harmed when I'm not at all. And it, it's not that I make it a big deal. There's something creating that. So when I think about the no birth, the no death, 
if we're all one big thing, if we're all truly, I think of it as I'm, when I, when I really come from a place of I'm truly connected with all things and everything is, everything is existing because I'm existing here, everything existing because that leaf is here and the sun and the stars and the wind and every single thing, that 100%, that big everything, acronym B E B. Um, <laughs> then that little teeny weeny, you know, then that greedy, gra I, I'm so, that graspingness, you know, that's, that delusion that I'm being harmed is that's the most thing, all this self-preservation that kind yeah. of goes by the wayside. And that's easy yeah. for me to think now sitting in my beautiful little living room with you lovely people, but you know, <laughs> gosh, oh my gosh, yes, my home was being bombed or, you know, horrible things were happening. But most of the time, just the cloud, the, this, I think it's in my nervous system, just this cloud of um, my oh, this is, should be another way or the revisiting the past. I really think there's like a physical sensation happens and then yeah. it um, manifests as an unpleasant thought, like yeah. there's a, maybe a physical unease. And then now all of a sudden I'm re reliving this history of, oh, it should have been another way. Yeah. So I was thinking about that. Letting go of my narrow views. What's wrong? What could go wrong? I'm wrong. They were wrong, you know? <laughs> And so mm -hmm. this, I like the Buddhist practice because it help, helps me kind of unwind. And there are these beautiful moments when I can read something like this and hear you beautifully read it to us and just and go, yeah, that's right, you know. But I, yeah. and it's just again and again and again and again, come, having to come back and take refuge because of this the cloud of misery that's ballooning yeah. so un so unwanted and whatever. Sunny, I hope I'm kind of not rambling on. Thank you. Beautiful. And I, and I think especially, you know, putting our own words to these views, you know, it's that I think is so powerful. So even if we don't all describe this tonight, like, yeah, hearing Diane just describe the big everything. I remember you said that two weeks ago too, like what a wonderful concept, the big everything, everything is included. Everything is connected. You know, what is our word? Um, Cause again, it's so wonderful to have these guides and it has to become real for us, that sense of interdependence. And, you know, as an upsell for this looking towards uh, the connection of all things, you know, it really feels to me when I'm in the flow of that consciousness, when I'm able to really sense my connection, life is a lot more beautiful like a lot more beautiful. And all of a sudden, like coincidences arise. Of course, they're already there. We're just not paying attention. And so that feeling of being part of and in flow with reality, instead of like exerting our will upon reality, it is, it's, I mean, hopefully it leads to enlightenment, but at the very least, it's just such a great way to live you know, and, and it will, it'll gently, slowly start to like wear down our ideas and beliefs of like, I love the, the words you use, like that cloud of, of clinging and me and mine, that it just feels terrible. Like this afternoon, when I had that experience of being heard and then frustrated, um, it was such an embodied, um, energetic pull. It was so unpleasant. And, and sometimes I think we all have it. It's like, you can have that lean back. We have that perspective. All of a sudden we're like, this is going to pass. This is temporary, but it, yeah. So powerful. Anyone else on birth and death? Yeah, please. Maybe I'll go like this so I can talk to both sides. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've been spending time with a new baby recently. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I've been reflecting on on this a lot. And uh, I think that that's so this passage is so incredible, because um, it's like that that leaf was always there. And it, it, it will always be there. Um, and it uh, it's like there's, it's just changing from one form to another, like the cloud and the rain. And um, I think there's so much humility in the uh, when you look into this and with that humility also comes a lot of hope hmm. because the uh, perspective comes yeah right like our our scope and size and scale and it's overwhelming and powerful but also um 
uh, like really reassuring. Mm, yeah. Mm. Thank I you think. so much. Yeah. I love that. And that, that kind of, yeah, seeing the new babies or seeing folks, you know, on their way out, you know, they're like heading to the next place. It's that real sense of the continuity of some energy and, and not again, you don't need to get metaphysical and believe in other lifetimes to see that there's a transfer of energy, right. And this connection, um, so he says here, the great papala tree was his brother, could be a sister, in practice. Um, this evening star, which appeared as he sat down in meditation each night, was also his sister in practice. He meditated far into the night. Um, through mindfulness, Siddhartha's mind, body, and breath were perfectly at one. His practice of mindfulness had enabled him to build great powers of concentration, which he could now shine his awareness on his mind and body. After deeply entering meditation, he began to discern the presence of countless beings in his own body in the present moment. Organic and inorganic beings, minerals and mosses, grasses, insects, animals, and people all within him. He saw that other beings were himself right in the present moment. He saw his own past lives, all his births and deaths. He saw the creation and destructions of thousands of worlds and thousands of stars. He felt all the joys and the sorrows of every living being, those born of mothers, those born of eggs, and those born of fission, who divided themselves into new creatures. He saw that every cell of his body contained all of heaven and earth and spanned the three times, past, present, and future. So that's, um, we do get in the metaphysical there a little bit. I'm not going to lie. And it is interesting. Um, some of you may have had opportunity to learn from or read about teachers who really can recount their past lives and have that sense of continuity. At this point, you know, where science is, we recognize that at least in one family line, there is a form of knowledge and wisdom that can be passed down through our DNA epigenetically. You know, so if there are messages and information that's being passed down to us from our mothers and our mother's mothers, you know, the idea that you could develop such a, a sensory kind of perception and insight that you could recognize all the history of your ancestors that's one way to think about it. Um, I think the idea of all these past lives, that, that can be a lot harder for folks. And um, I don't think you need to abide by that to feel the richness of, especially here, just feeling all the joys and all the sorrows of the world at once. And as my dear friend um, and Dharma brother, Tig O'Malley often says this holding both, right? Holding the joys and the sorrows together. That is such an exquisite moment. You know, again, in our age where we are trying to optimize and avoid suffering, we're often just trying to push down what feels bad and increase what feels good. And we're not really giving ourselves that flexibility, that equanimity of holding both and holding both ideally without such a strong preference. And in here, he's getting a glimpse into the, the joys and sorrows of every living being. It's such a tough one in the days that we live in to really turn towards the joys and the sorrows. Um, I found myself with enough time last weekend to really just sit with myself and allow myself to think of the state of our world and the violence and the degradation and the inequalities. And it is so hard to sit there. Like truly as a practice to sit there, you know, it really, I don't know about you all can feel like a tidal wave and like, there's no way out and you're just going to get pulled under and there's going to be another wave. So hard to touch it. And I remember, <laughs> this is so silly, but Mr. Rogers, great Dharma teacher, and he says, you know, when there is catastrophe and chaos, like look for the people who are helping. Right. So they're also there, like who's showing up to help. And there's so many catastrophes in recent weeks. They I can at this moment not list all of them, but who's there helping? Who's there helping? And I think it's such a beautiful example of holding both.
and and the richness of that it's so hard to dip into and i really understand why myself and probably many others like to compartmentalize and maybe not dip into that um, but I think in our practice, it's it's a beautiful place to do so and to give ourselves that time. If we don't, it's it's still there. None of us can kind of close all the door and batten down all the hatches of our senses and our mind to not feel the incredible sorrows of our world, our small world with the people we know, the greater world of our community, and then you know, our deeply interconnected world. So I think of like how these practices can support us. And I really am inspired by this vision of being able to hold all the joys and the sorrows, partially through this more clear perception of knowing that it's all changing and it's all shifting. And because this, when you really look at these sorrows and tragedies, it does feel fixed. And it's not that it isn't real and painful, but recognizing that is all moving, changing and shifting is encouraging. And I don't think a spiritual bypass, though we could use it to bypass, right? We could look at all suffering and say, oh, that's just an illusion. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not. And it's also not the only thing, you know, not the only thing. Um, Without wavering, he shined his awareness on his mind. He saw that living beings suffer because they don't understand they share one common ground with all beings. Ignorance gives rise to a multitude of sorrows, confusions, and troubles. Greed, anger, arrogance, doubt, jealousy, and fear all have their roots in ignorance. When we learn to calm our minds in order to look deeply at the true nature of things, we can arrive at a full understanding, which dissolves every sorrow and anxiety and gives rise to acceptance and love. Siddhartha now saw that understanding and love are one. Without understanding, there can be no love. Each person's disposition is the result of physical, emotional, and social conditions. When we understand this, we cannot hate even a person who behaves cruelly but we can strive to help transform his physical, emotional, and social conditions. Understanding gives rise to compassion and love, which in turn give rise to correct action. In order to love, it is first necessary to understand. So understanding is the key to liberation. In order to attain clear understanding, it's necessary to live mindfully, making direct contact with life in the present moment, truly seeing what is taking place within and outside of oneself. Practicing mindfulness strengthens the ability to look deeply. And when we look deeply into the heart of anything, it will reveal itself. This is the secret treasure of mindfulness. It leads to the realization of liberation and enlightenment. Life is illuminated by right understanding, right thought, right speech, right action, right livelihood right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. So I love this kind of almost like map that it is like our liberation requires essentially our ability to love fully and our ability to love fully is dependent upon understanding and clear seeing and not the kind of understanding where we're like, I'm gonna figure this out, right? Just that understanding like as he was saying here, that each, you know, even someone who behaves cruelly has these physical, emotional, and social conditions. Not that we can't be angry at them for a couple of weeks, but that we can see clearly the why. And so we don't get caught up in a sense of kind of grudge for too long. So with that, I'm going to have us do a little more practice here together. I hope that those words are a bit stirring to kind of make us feel a little motivated for our practice. And so we're going to come back and do a bit of shamatha, training this mind in concentration. So finding a posture that is going to be helpful to not fall asleep, which is hard this hour of the night. Maybe finding that upright spine. 
and kind of feeling the dignity of the posture. Giving ourselves this imaginary sense of just being like Siddhartha, sitting down by the riverside, dedicating ourselves to a deep, clear seeing of our moment to moment experience. So we'll apply our shamatha or our attention to the sense portals. Beginning with the sense portal of sound. Then training our mind to really notice and receive sounds. Noticing when sounds rise and when they fall away. Noticing sounds that are steady. Noticing the full range and resonance and tone of the bell. Thoughts, memories, and images will arise. Just re-engaging with our intention and purpose, relaxing more deeply, and coming back to continue paying attention mindfully to sound. Shifting our attention and awareness to the play of light behind our closed eyes. Noticing areas where there's some darker shadows, some movement or light. Curious, relaxed attention.
shifting our attention and awareness to the sensations in the body. Once again, noticing this whole field of tactile sensations in the body, letting that be our anchor for mindfulness. Allowing ourselves this opportunity to refine our attention further by focusing in on the breath. Really paying such close attention to the breath as though it were like a rider on a horse. Noticing the breath as it's traveling in. Continue noticing the breath as it travels out. Breath by breath is how we train our attention. So subtle, sometimes so hard. Really connecting to this motivation. Knowing that if we can follow the subtlety of the breath, we can start to develop an ability to follow the thoughts, the emotions, recognizing them before they carry us away. Using each breath as a training ground to start noticing and tracking the many movements of the mind. Coming back, coming back, coming back.
now that we've spent a bit of time creating a stable base for attention, we consider what is our intention? Starting with an intention that is a guiding light. What motivates us to be here tonight? What motivates us in our endeavors in the world? Letting that motivation feel like an illuminated lantern. Maybe it's a word or a phrase. And really bring it to the forefront of the mind. And then also consider what is your intention right now, down on the ground, this day, this moment. Our overarching intention may reflect our values, our goals. But for this slice, this more personal, intimate intention and aspiration, consider what is needed right now in this stage and phase of life. could be a behavior or activity that would support that greater intention. Something we add in or maybe take away from what we're doing in our day to day. Just allowing the more quiet nature of our attention and awareness to help us find this. Really feeling the enrichment of setting an intention. This tether for us to not forgetting. Helping us keep in mind the daily practices that support us and the overarching goal. And using the momentum of this intention to move towards our dedication of this evening and this time together. The dedication of merit is a, a symbolic way. We recognize that what we do here together is for the sake of every single being. In the aspiration that all beings could be safe, that all beings could be healthy and free that all beings could feel peace and ease. Thank you everyone for your practice and reflections. We almost made it through the enlightenment. I think we only have one more night now. Um, I'll be back here next week and Mace has some announcements for us.